tonight here at Lone Cedar. Once again, we're faced with a, another obstacle to overcome, but we're going to trudge our way on through it. Uh, we don't have any power, so we're going to try to broadcast this through Rodney's phone. Uh, I told him like, we could do, we could do it through mine, but I don't know how to do that. So. Uh, but we're blessed again tonight to be able to come together and worship together, even though we're not physically together, we're together spiritually. Um, we have Brother Ron Gun or Jimmy Goins that's going to speak to us tonight. Um, glad that he's here. We're blessed to have him with us. Uh, Take Gooch will be leading our singing, but as, as we always do, let's start our worship together tonight with a prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this day. Our Father, we thank you so much for the blessings that you pour out on us every day. Our Father, we thank you so much for the technology that we have enjoyed, Father. Father, the ability to stream these services live. Father, we thank you so much for that. Our Father, we ask that you would be with us tonight as we gather together as Christians of like precious faith, Father. Father, we know that you are with us no matter where we are. Our Father, we ask that you would bless us during this time. Our Father, we ask that you be with those who are sick, Father. We ask that you be with those who are suffering. Our Father, we ask that you be with those who administer to them. Father, bless them and keep them healthy. Our Father, we thank you so much for this congregation that meets here at Lone Cedar. We thank you so much for everything that people do in this congregation, Father, to try to go out and spread your word. Our Father, we ask that you would be with us. Help us to sing with the spirit and understanding, Father. Help us to study and show ourselves approved. We thank you so much for everything you do. And it's through Christ's name we pray. Amen. built on nothing less. <clears throat> My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only lean on Jesus' name. Again, they, they really weren't concerned about 
anything except to bring Jesus problems, cause problems, hurt his reputation, destroy his character if they could. Jesus answered these questions, though, in the a way you would expect him to in a masterful way. The second question is chapter 12, uh, verse, uh, I think that's the last verse, uh, last part of verse 14. The question was asked, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not? And again, Jesus turned the question on them and handled them in such an effective way. Uh, the third question is in verse 22 of uh, verse 23 it is of Mark chapter 12 and the question is in the resurrection when they rise again whose wife should, will she be for the seven had her as wife very familiar story to you seven brothers the oldest brother married he died the wife became the, the wife of the second brother and so on down to all seven. And so the question was, in the resurrection, whose wife should she be? Again, Jesus knew how to handle that question very well and dealt with it and exposed uh, their real desires. But I want to read now verses uh, 28 through 31 of Mark chapter 12. And this is the section we're going to deal with for the most part here in the next uh, just few short minutes. This is uh, revolving around the section that's referred to as the greatest commandment. Beginning in verse 28, one of the scribes came up and heard, uh, heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he answered them well, they asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, The most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. The second is this, You shall love the neighbor as your, your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment, commandment greater than these. The reason I want to share some thoughts along these lines is, When we are baptized into Jesus, when we become a Christian, we just begin our Christian journey. We then go through a growth process, and that process is something we go through to the day we die, hopefully, or as long as we are mentally capable of doing that. And it's, it's, it's important that we really understand that God expects each of us to continue to grow in our relationship with Him. Peter writes, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I've always uh, wondered why the question was phrased as it was. Grow in grace and in knowledge. I've often wondered if, if uh, Peter didn't realize, the Holy Spirit didn't realize, that as we grow in knowledge, we really most likely need to grow in grace as well. So we can gracefully handle the knowledge we uh, develop and, and build. We're told that there are some 613 commandments in the Old Testament. 248 in the positive, 365 in the negative. Jesus, when he's asked what's the greatest commandment, I've always been amazed. He doesn't pause, he doesn't hesitate. He doesn't stop and say, well, give me just a minute to think. He says very quickly, the greatest is this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. Now when we read that verse, we must be struck by, by the emphasis Jesus places on this, the significance he places. Lord, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. Now, for the best of Christians, this is a challenge. And it's something we can work on and develop throughout our life. Uh, just a few thoughts about this uh, expression, all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The heart 
probably has significance in addressing the center and the seat of our spiritual life, the seat of thoughts, passions, desires, affections, purposes, endeavors of things done from the heart, and that is things are done sincerely and truly. And Jesus doesn't say, love the Lord your God with, with most of your heart, with a lot of your heart. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart. That's a challenge. And it's something we need to really think about and pray about and ask God for wisdom in, in dealing with that and really reaching that point where we can say, I want to love God with all my heart. The expression, with all your soul, probably has reference to the seed of the feelings, the desires and affections. The soul uh, is, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the mind is a faculty of understanding, feeling and desiring and strength probably has reference to the ability, strength, might, to the extent of one's ability. Now what I want us to, to really think about is simply this. As we think about this response of Jesus, this is a tremendously challenging thought. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. And so this is a, a lifelong process. It's something we work on constantly. And as a Christian, we should not be satisfied with just reaching a, de a degree of love or, or a, a, a certain percentage of, of loving God. Because Jesus is very clear. We're to love Him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. The question is, is asked sometimes, why should we love God like this? And the, the best response I can think of, and it's not to be uh, cute or, or short, but we should simply because He's God. He is the Almighty Creator. He made us. He's saving us. And so as a Christian especially, we should look forward to this idea of loving Him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Now, if this is the most important commandment, and Jesus says it is, let me suggest this really ought to be the focus of our life. If this is the most important commandment, this should be the focus of our life and our relationship with Jesus. Loving God is a challenge for maybe some reasons we've never seen. We've probably never really heard from Him except through His written word. All we know about Him is what we read about him. And so it's very important. It is, it's really not important. It's critical that we use our lifetime in coming to know God better and better, more clearly and more clearly. There's only one place we're going to be able to learn about God in that way. That's his word. Now what I want us to think about too is Jesus is saying this and, and wanting people to understand the, serious, uh, the seriousness of this command. We love Him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so when we become, when we become a Christian, we're grateful to God for what He's done for us. We're grateful that Jesus has saved us from our sins. We're thankful for the spiritual blessings we receive, but the truth is our knowledge and understanding of God is most likely quite small. And so we spend the rest of our Christian life growing in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The most important commandment is not obedience to law. It's a commitment to a person. A relationship with God 
who is indeed our Heavenly Father. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 23, Jesus, on another occasion, he was dealing with the scribes, some of the Pharisees. And verse 23 says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees! And he simply very bluntly calls them hypocrites. For you tithe men and deal in coming and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. We can go through our life as a Christian being quite serious, being uh, diligent, and yet going in, in the wrong areas. Not necessarily wrong, but not the best of areas. We spend our time uh, doing a number of things instead of really coming to know God and our Lord Jesus. And that takes a great amount of time. So Jesus said the greatest commandment is to love the Lord our God with all our heart, our soul, our mind, our strength. And it then says to love our neighbor as ourself. I won't spend just a, a little bit of time talking about this. Uh, the question is so often asked, well, who's our neighbor? In Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, the Bible says, You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Even the Old Testament emphasizes they were to love their neighbor as themselves. So that's, that was new to New Testament Christianity. Luke chapter 10, uh, Jesus is discussing this. And he describes who one's neighbor is. Very familiar story, beginning in verse 25 of Luke chapter 10. We refer to it as the parable of the Good Samaritan. One traveling. Maybe he's traveling in a rough area, falls among thieves, he's beaten, he's robbed, and just left. First, a priest comes by. The priest sees what's happened to this man and he just simply passes by on the other side. Sometime later, a Levite comes by, does the same thing, same reaction. But then a Samaritan came by. And most of us recognize there was a great deal of hostility that existed between the Jews and the Samaritans. They had little love if any, for each other. But it was the Samaritan who took the time and made the effort to help this man, take him to an end, care for him. He had to leave. He gave the caretaker, uh, the innkeeper, money. He said, you take care of this guy. When I come back, it costs you more. I'll, I'll repay you for that. Jesus emphasizes this was a neighbor to the Samaritan. This is the one who came to his aid and saw that his needs were met. In Romans chapter 13, verses 9 and 10, Paul writes, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. In 1 John chapter 4, and we'll conclude with two or three verses here. I want to take time. First John chapter 4. I'd like to read uh, verses, uh, if I can. Uh, verses 7 through 12. It's interesting to me that I was, as I was thinking about this sermon the last couple of days, that not just one or two writers talked about this subject of love in the New Testament. Jesus clearly did in the Gospels, but so did Paul time and time again. So did John. So did Peter. 
And, and I, I, I want us to really understand, if we are serious about our Christianity, if we really understand what God wants us to do and become, we're going to focus on loving God with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, and all our strength. All right, 1 John chapter 4, beginning of verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Now, when we think about some of these statements, it seems we could understand uh, John's words here to mean those who don't love maybe have not been born of God and doesn't know God. I think that's something serious to think about. Verse 8, he says, anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. Two times in this verse, in verse 16, John will say, God is love. You know this, but let me just mention this again. He's not saying that God loves or God has love. He is by his very nature, his very essence is love. God is love. Uh, verse 9. In this the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent His only Son. Here is a demonstration of God's love. God sent His Son into the world so that we might live through Him. God showed His love. Now we in turn need to show our love for Him and make that the focus of our Christian life. Loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Verse 10. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also love, ought to love one another. I wanted to share some of these things with you because, uh, frankly, it's good for me to, to refer to, to subjects and thoughts like this occasionally. We can become somewhat uh, set in our Christian life. We can uh, not be challenged in our thinking sometimes and, and we just kind of slide through the Christian life. But if we want to be what God wants us to be, we really can't afford to do that. We need to understand when, when the Bible teaches these things about love, God expects us to strive to love Him with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind and all our strength and to love our neighbor as ourselves. Now folks, that's not natural. That doesn't come easy. It really is something we must focus on and think about. I'm grateful for the opportunity to be with you tonight. I hope this has been some help to you. Let me encourage you. Spend time with God. Spend time with His Word and grow in grace and knowledge and focus on loving God with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, and all our strength. If we at Lone Cedar can be of service to you, we'd be glad and grateful to be able to do that. If you will, get in touch with us and we'll get back with you and do our best to meet your needs. Thank you very much and appreciate your time. Blend with one song, uh, we will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of Lords, who is the Great I Am. Hallelujah to the King of Kings.
we was kind of laughing before service. The old devil was trying to keep us from having service by turning the power out. But, uh, you know, we made things happen. I think, you know, we was able to save some lives tonight, hopefully as well, with the message Brother Jimmy did. It's kind of funny. We was talking last time we preached about not having so many people here, but it preached in the shade tree about the same number of people. I think tonight is probably the first time he's ever done it in a dark. And in the front part of the church, in the foyer, instead of the pulpit. But hopefully, uh, we've just seen the power come back over here at Lone Cedar, I believe. Uh, and hopefully it's come back home at your location as well. If not, maybe soon, as the storm approach, you can pay attention to the weather and uh, the news channels and stuff to see and confirm that. Um, to stay safe. But at this time, we'd like to uh, end our service with a closing prayer, if you would, bow your head, as Brother Jimmy also mentioned, that if there's anything that any of the elders or ministers here at Long Center can do for you, we'd appreciate if you reach out to us, and uh, we'll try our best to help you out. Let's go with God in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we humbly bow before thy throne, thank you for all many blessings of life. Father, we thank you for the avenue that we have to study, our, study your word, Father, and to go closer to you. We ask you to bless us and keep us safe throughout the approaching storms, Father, tonight. And we thank you for the rain that we have received. Father, we know at times we often complain about the weather and the situation that we are in. But Father, help us to always remember that those are gifts from you and that you know what we need and you provide as you see fit. Father, we're most grateful for your son that you sent to this great uh, earth that you created to go about daily walking this earth to be an example for us and to go to the cruel cross for us to die. And someday if we be found faithful, my eternal life in heaven will be found faithful. Father, this time we pray for those who are sick and afflicted, especially those who have lost loved ones. We ask them to comfort thy heart as thou knowest how. Bless us and keep us always. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.